Do you like movies and television? Would you like to learn more about the magic behind the movies and learn how they get from the minds of the creators to the screen? Do you consider yourself a bit of a film buff and would like to know more without going back to school? Then this is the show for you. Mincing Movie Magic is a broadcast designed to stimulate your intellect and explore the minds of screenwriters, producers, directors, and others behind the scenes who create the real magic we see on the screen. Each week, you can listen to screenwriter and producer Tom Blumquist and professional magician Scott Wells as they discuss film and the magic that goes into every production. From time to time, they welcome friends from the movie industry to give other points of view that brought their visions to life on screen. This is Mincing Movie Magic. Please welcome Hollywood writer, producer, and director Tom Blumquist, along with your host, Scott Wells. And there we are. Hey, Tom, how are you, sir? I'm good. Here's to you. And right back at you, my friend. It was uh, good seeing you in uh, Charleston uh, this past weekend. And uh, thank you for coming out here for our daughter's um, big fundraiser. And you were a great MC and magician. Let me, let me put an adjective in front of that. That was a successful fundraiser. Yes, it that was. was. It was really awesome. And she uh, really knocked it out of the park and did so well. Uh, let's see, there was something over there that was going to um, put that. Yeah, it was for goingplacesnonprofit.org. So if people wanted to do some more to help uh, give some money towards the organization, I mean, for their nonprofit, they can do that. Okay. But, uh, yeah, That's the weather tax was... Tax deductible, so it's uh, there, she's a 501c3. So, uh, But they give bikes, uh, custom, brand-new custom bikes, helmets and locks to uh, disadvantaged children. And um, some of these kids are really disadvantaged and, uh, and then also halloween costumes i understand too yeah, halloween costumes some of these families are too poor to afford costumes for their kids they go to school and they're you know yeah. they feel a odd man out because they they don't they don't fit in and so she rolls up with the truck and the costume racks roll off and all these volunteers the social workers get the, let the kids pick out any costume they want so they can fit in and right put, when they do their costume parade and it's just, it's wonderful. So anyway, going places, nonprofit.org. And thanks for the plug. You bet. That was a lot of fun uh, up in Charleston. And I loved uh, the, all the history you showed me around uh, going out on the, uh, in the Bay to take a tour to see uh, Fort Sumter there and then doing a carriage ride downtown. It was just amazing. Hey, Tom Gentile's here from, uh, he's in the East Coast over in Southampton and then Michigan. We got Harriet uh, in also. Hello, uh, Harriet. So glad uh, Tom, you and Gentile and, uh, and Harriet are both here. That's uh, great. Thank you guys for joining us again this week. It's uh, going to be just, again, a lot of fun. But this was just the, the perfect weather. I, you mean, and I, you've almost convinced me to move to Charleston. <laughs> Such a beautiful little town. Uh, we and we didn't enjoy you that much. We did not enjoy it that much. So please reconsider. <laughs> just come, then go. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a terrific place to live, obviously. And I'm glad you had a good time. Well, and uh, yeah, getting the chance to meet the uh, the mayors of both cities, and uh, then the Congress lady, or, uh, and also there, uh, it was just a wonderful time. And that, uh, hello, Jeff, uh, Jeff, glad that you are with us also here today. Well, listen, I'm glad we were starting to get a few people into the room over here. Oh, and uh, again, I want, it is great. Uh, one last thing, by the way, that just as a a quick promo for a, as a reminder about the uh, the book that is available over there, Devious Thinking, which is uh, Tom's newest book. Uh, and Silent Partners, if you want to check out uh, TomBlomquist.com. And uh, it is, uh, it's a good read, a lot of fun. And uh, buy it now before it comes out in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. All righty. Well, I'll tell you what, we got just a, a great guest again this week and someone uh, who has <laughs> his credits. If you go to IMDb, I mean, it's longer. It, it, it's, a, it's a lot. <laughs> you got to go there and check this guy out. Tom, please, uh, let's introduce him since he's your buddy. Well, it's, uh, his name is Chuck Bowman, and he is a producer and director, uh, also writes and acts, and I don't know, basket weaves. I, I don't know what else he does, but he, <laughs> he is one of my uh, oldest and best friends uh, in the industry, and uh, we've produced a couple of projects, a series and a mini series together, and he's directed episodes on shows that I produced, and he kind of mentored me when I got my first episodes to direct. And uh, so we've been friends for a long time. Get get in here. Get Bring him in. Bring him in. 
There we uh, go. There he is. My God. My <laughs> God. There he is. But he, uh, Chuck has directed and produced shows like Alienation and, and, uh, uh, God, uh, let's let's talk about him, uh, uh, Doctor Quinn, Medicine Woman, and Profiler, and Pretender, and uh, Walker, Texas Ranger, uh, Swamp Thing. We worked on together. Just about every genre, from science fiction to westerns yeah. to sitcoms to everything. Is that right, Chuck? Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, you know, started uh, doing little thirty-minute comedies, uh, sure, uh, uh, Werewolf of London kind of uh, shows, and they were and they came from outer space. They were a lot of fun. And yep. what was the one we did, Tom, um, with, um, you know, when when uh, I came on and it was a seven-day show, became a six-day show, became a... Oh, uh, Shades of L.A. Shades That's of it. LA. Yeah. Yeah. So Chuck uh, yeah, rolls, rolls with the punches, as they say. He, start, he, was, he was preparing to direct an episode, Scott, of a show, and we had a six-day schedule, like a seven-day schedule like most shows, and uh, about, you, know, you get seven days to prep in or, uh, seven days of shooting and right uh, halfway through there they came in and said well uh chuck uh, you got six days and then chuck I, if i'm not mistaken a day or two later right before you were shooting they said no you have five days that's and right they, and they were cutting the script they just said you got to do this the show in less because they were kind of uh uh, choking on uh, budget overages i guess and and they needed to cut back and they decided well Bowman's the guy that's going to have to eat this. <laughs> and somehow he did. It was one of our best episodes uh, of this little show. And and it was, you know, really fun. And uh, so that, that uh, I'd almost forgotten about that one, Chuck. Yeah. But uh, yeah. there you go. It was fun. Yeah, we had a good time with it. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned about having uh, different genres that you have worked from, again, sci-fi to westerns and everything how do you transition from one to the other is there some secret or it's just kind of like that's what they hand you or then you say you go with that or do you yeah. prefer one or how did that come about what do you think well, it's all it's all about the story and um, if you have an interesting script interesting story interesting characters then it really doesn't matter um you know what the genre is uh, i particularly liked uh, uh, sci-fi and uh, westerns. Uh, I enjoyed the comedies a lot. I, I, you know, I, th I think I kind of, I kind of enjoyed everything that I did. But you know, the uh, uh, Chuck, one of the things about you uh, is that you love movies, classic movies. Hell yes, John, absolutely. John Ford and Hitchcock and all those guys, and you're very uh, conversational about those classics, and yeah. so that applies to your work. Well, obviously, if, if you're somebody that uh, is culturally um, illiterate and you don't have that frame of reference, then it would be hard to move through all those genres. But like writers who have to write different genres, directors have to execute it in a, not only the style of the series, but yes. the style of the genre and, and yeah. you know, of course, whatever the script requires. But uh, I think that's, you know, something that uh, not everybody adheres to anymore. Now, there's some young guys out there that are really not film fans, or if they are, you know, it's what, what did J.J. Abrams do last, as opposed to, you know, what did some of the, the screen legends do? And yeah. uh, and there's a difference. Oh, well, I, I grew up, uh, as you know, Tom, loving motion pictures, and I was determined as a little guy that I was going to be in the movie business at some point. And I just kept driving there. Just before I came into television uh, scripted series narratives, I uh, I was a television news reporter in Los Angeles, and I rode around with the camera crew. And those were hot days. Those were back in the late '60s and early '70s. So I, uh, you know, I saw a lot of action on the street. Uh, you know, there's certainly enough dead bodies and and talked to enough politicians, uh, was at the ambassador of the hotel the night that Robert Kennedy was assassinated and followed that story for a while, the Charles Manson story I was on for a long time. And uh, Weren't you in that photo also of, uh, of uh, Ted or Robert Kennedy whenever that Sirhan, Sirhan had yeah. shot him and they got a yeah. photo? And, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I, I, I don't know which photo, but there is, uh, and I think Tom has seen it, there is a piece of video of me trying to calm people down in the crowd and, and saying into the microphone to the, to the, um, to the uh, control room downstairs in a truck to start recording, hit recording, hit recording, because, uh, you know, I knew, I knew we were into something that night. And, um, and then one day, you know, after seven years in news, and I was kind of getting bored with it because you talk to enough politicians and, um, and seen enough adversity and a lot of action on the street. And I went in and, and resigned and said, told the general manager I was going to go work in movies. And he, he said, what are you talking about, Chuck? You're too old to do that, to start there. And I said, that may be, but it's what I've always wanted to do. So that's what I'm going to go do. And, uh, and how did you go from that day to meeting Steve Cannell and yeah. Yeah, it was a Black Sheep Squadron, I think, was the first show, right? Yeah, Bob Bob as a reminder, Steve Cannell is the, was a showrunner for the A-Team, among others. Yeah. Well, he was a creator of them, too. Yeah, yeah. legendary. Um, legendary. He, uh, Steve Cannell created 41 television series. Not all of them went, but uh, he was the most creative, independent um, creator in Hollywood for, for many, many years. Um, How did you meet him? Uh, well, I met him. He was, believe it or not, he was a gopher. He was an intern on a game show in syndication at the station uh, that I was working at. And it was called Seven Keys. And Jack Nars was the host and it had come off network and it, it was syndicated. And um, Steve was uh, just fresh out of SC and he was working for two female producers. And um, uh, by a little sidebar story, one day they were talking to him about what he wanted to do in his future. And he said, well, I want to be a writer. And they said, well, fine, bring something in that you've written. And so he brought in a script that he had written and um, they kept it for a couple of days, called him in and said, you need to stay in the furniture business, in your father's furniture business, because <laughs> you won't make it in this. And by the way, that bothered him for years. Um, you know, just in the back of his mind. But Stephen was another one of these kind of guys like like Tom, and I think I can identify, you know, we weren't going to be stopped. We were going to keep going. Uh, you know, I my first jobs were, oh, uh, booth announcing at a television station, uh, narration on some travel shows. Uh, and I bumped into Cannell one day, and he's, he has, uh, he had a magnet, magnetic personality and with a lot of enthusiasm about everything. He loved everything about movies and films. And uh, we started hitting it off and we would just take all the time that we could afford to be together and talk about being in movies. And he started, he started writing uh, spec scripts. And he, his agent got him an interview at uh, Adam 12 for Jack Webb. And uh, they said, uh, what was his name? Tom is the, the uh, producer on there. Anyway, told him that they didn't have a script to start shooting on a Friday. And this was a Monday. And he said, the producer says, I've talked to three writers now. And the guy that can come in with a script, a shooting script on Thursday is going to be a story editor and Stephen was the first one in they hired him and uh, you know he did some pilots for Jack Jack Webb Jack Webb was a good guy he was uh, he was easy I, I I was acting on Adam 12 and uh, oh uh, Dragnet and Jack thought I could I could uh, I was pretty good at revoicing actors that he didn't particularly like so uh, I was doing well as Stephen was with Jack. What, mean revoicing? what does revoicing mean? It means that uh, Jack didn't like the voice or the reading oh. of an actor. And he, he had tried, he'd brought him in and tried to get a performance that he liked. And if he didn't get it, he called me. Hmm. So and, it's, a post, it's a post production thing, you know, like a foreign film. You know, they, they, they go from Spanish to English and they have English yeah. actors put words in the mouth. Well, you do that in. 
our own culture as well. So it's very common. If uh, yeah. you know, the first Schwarzenegger movie, they didn't use his voice because nobody could understand it. <laughs> so they brought in an actor yeah. with a voice that plausibly could come out of that body. And and uh, there's a whole big industry of people like Chuck that, that will do voiceover work and you go line by line, scene by scene and re, gotcha. literally re-perform it. That's it. Just the audio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then, the, you know, then Steve Cannell called me one day and he said, listen, I've written a pilot called Baba Black Sheep, and it uh, it's the story of Pappy Boynton, who was a Congressional Medal of Honor winner for his exploits in the South Pacific during the war. And the Black Sheep were his small band of pilots who took on the Japanese in the South Pacific. And uh, and, and Stephen said to me, I know you've, you've done documentaries before, uh, and we're going to use a mixture of second unit flying material as well as as uh, video or 16 millimeter film from the Department of Defense. And we've kind of got to put all that together. And uh, why don't you come in and interview for that job? I did. I got the job. I wasn't very good at it. I really wasn't. I was, uh, I mean, it was a miracle I kept that job, I think. But, um, you know, from there... Um, you know, Stephen let me produce on that series, my first producing job. And then uh, when it uh, was eventually canceled, uh, I went over on Incredible Hulk uh, on its first year and uh, became a supervising producer there. And over a period of time, I knew what that title would allow me eventually, and that was to assign myself a directing slot. And uh, so... I started that and they, they seemed to like what I was doing. So I, I repeated uh, a number of times and did some writing on that series as well. And I then just, from there, it just went on alien nation and all of that. I know he starred also not only in the uh, incredible hope, but uh, he was uh, a magician also. And, uh, Oh, Chuck, that's a, that's a $50 fine. Yes, of course. I'll pay it. Tom will pay it for me. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, uh, did you have anything to do with The Magician, with Bill Bixby also? No, but I didn't. Uh, uh, Incredible Hulk was, uh, was, about, uh, was about it. Uh, you know, we, we almost cast Schwarzenegger as The Incredible Hulk, but actually he was sh too short. And Lou Ferrigno had size and muscle and all that. And because Lou had a hearing problem, right. his intensity when he would look at people was just captivating. And, and, and uh, so we hired Lou, and it was the right choice. And yeah. I think Arnold would be the first one to say that. Uh, um, uh, but I, I enjoyed that uh, a lot. Uh, and we did, we did a lot of things very challenging. There was some. There was someone who had also asked about. I think about Steve Cannell, whether that uh, he had done Rat Patrol or combat. Um, he had. Uh, no, he didn't do combat. Uh, Wanted dead or alive. I mean, that was way before him. Have gun will travel all hype. Yeah. Um, a team certainly he created that. With he created. He created a team. Yeah, and, and Chuck, uh, Chuck and I both worked on that at different yes. times. Yeah. Uh, the thing about uh, a team, the most enjoyable thing about a team was. Uh, uh, Mr. T, he Why was, so? well, he was a gentle giant. He was such a sweet man, a man of faith. And uh, I asked him one day, I said, T, uh, are you having a good time in Hollywood and show business? And he says, Chuck, Chuck, I'm just a fool. And he <laughs> says, you know, when they're done with me, I go back to Chicago and take care of my mother. And, and that's what he did. I'm just a and, fool. Uh, yeah, I'm just a fool. And uh, uh, our son, <clears throat> Stephen, is uh, 37 years old now. And when he was an infant, I have a picture of Mr. T holding Stephen, cradled in his arms. And when, uh, sadly, Steve Cannell died, Mr. T was there. And I've got a picture of Stephen, who was six, five and a half, uh, and uh, standing next to Mr. T. 
Wow. So we've always loved him a lot. The rest, the rest of that series was kind of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. Yes, it was. But you know, uh, Scott, I met Chuck um, at at the Kennel Organization. Uh, I was a story editor on a show Riptide, and he had the office right next door and was line producing the pilot of Hunter, which I don't even know if you remember that, but you were right next door. We had a common wall. And uh, uh, you got a chance to chat a bit, and then you bounced around at directing a bunch of things around the company. Uh, but it was really when we were both sent to Vancouver to do Stingray, yeah. I had a chance to really, you know, hang out with you and and uh, uh, you know find out how deranged you really are. And uh, you're, uh, you said you weren't going to talk about that, Tom. You uh, well, it's inevitable. People can tell, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> There's uh, profilers out there looking at you right now going, oh, gee, this guy's nuts. Now, now, Tom, I can say that if we're going to share stories, we can get into some interesting stuff here. Is that where you want me to go? Hey, I want to hear him. Come yeah. on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> well, we, uh, th that's where we really bonded. I mean, yeah. I knew it was in the company, like, you know, a bunch of people. It was a small company, but still everybody, like six shows going on and a lot of activity simultaneously. But um there's somebody, uh, Tom liked Hunter. Yeah, it was a good show. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we, it was up in Canada. Chuck was up there as the line producer, and I was sent up to be the, the supervising writing producer. The show had, was having a lot of problems. They were trying to retool the concept and all that stuff. And uh, it was kind of Chuck and me against the world. And, and yeah. you know, when you see somebody under fire, then you really see what they're made of, you know, just like in wartime, you know, with the, making movies is not wartime, but sometimes it feels like it is. And so yeah. we were, we, we had a chance. Well, you're to living together and working together more than 12 hours a day, you know? Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, we were. And we had, you know what? And we, and in spite of all that, we were having a great time. So mm -hmm. like, you know, we deal with the problems, we deal with them and then we'd go to dinner. <laughs> and, and laugh for the rest many of the fabulous restaurants in Vancouver. So yes. we we uh, we did that then, and then we went back there many years later uh, to do the Christie miniseries. And uh, he, Chuck had done uh, how many how many mo TV movies did you do up there over the years? I think uh, 14, 15. Yeah. So Chuck knew the city by by then from Stingray through all these TV movies he did for NBC. Uh, he knew it upside down and sideways. So it was. I had I hadn't really gotten to know the city on my first tour, and and it was really fun because yeah, you know we did have a chance to really see it. Well, getting into the business of where you are now, you explain kind of how that happened, but it's certainly a lot different, I would think, today than what it would have been back then. Uh, to a degree, it's similar in knowing people, but in having to prove yourself. Uh, but uh, do you just kind of feel like you were in the right place at the right time, or do you have any suggestions on how other people would get to do what you did? Well, uh, yeah, I have a couple of thoughts, uh, you know, and, and being at the right place at the right time. But I always had a philosophy from the time I, I was working in small television stations and wanted to make that move to Hollywood that I needed to get into the ballpark and that may be selling hot dogs, uh, sweeping up, but you get to know people, you get to meet people. And if you handle that well, it can often, you know, roll into relationships that can help you take some valuable steps uh, in your career. And that's, that's exactly what happened, you know. Now, um, you know, my philosophy is, for young people coming up is to work very hard, have a passion for what you're doing, that none of this guarantees anything, none of it, but it'll, it'll help you survive emotionally. And I think it can pay benefits if you're enjoying what you're doing, because it's a constant uh, state of going to school, of educating yourself, of being conversant with what's, what's now, what's been in the past and what's possible for the future in this craft that we're, we're in. I think, uh, I think that works for, you know, certainly Tom and I have talked about it over the years and I have two sons who are uh, still active 
uh, in uh, the film television business, and uh, they've both done very well. But mostly, it comes from just dedicating yourself to get out there and work your butt off and be you committed know? to doing that. Yeah, I mean, uh, both of them started as as gophers, and uh, and you know, again, I think that philosophy. You know, you you try to do your job efficiently. Uh, Steve Cannell once said to me that uh, he had approximately 500 young people out of the universities across the nation uh, solicit jobs, summer jobs, part-time jobs, gopher jobs. Uh, and uh, he would have a talk, he says, with all of them at some point, you know, either in small groups or individually. And um, his thing was you know, do your job and do it better than everybody else around you. And that'll serve you well. And he once said to me that the, my oldest son, he says, the thing that kind of set him apart was that he listened very carefully to the advice and the experience of those ahead of him. And that served him. He also studied uh, cinematography. He went to acting schools to, um, to learn uh, how to communicate with actors. He'd do scenes and he had no intention of being an actor. He just wanted to be able to connect with actors in their mindset and their, their emotions. Uh, and certainly my early acting uh, had served me well in dealing with uh, actors and actresses over the years. You know, you were talking about uh, getting in the ballpark and yeah. there's something to be said for it making sure you are in the right place. So when the right time comes along, you know, right time, right place. Yes. Well, it, it isn't just that you're walking down the street and you're hit by lightning. That's you right. You yourself in position to potentially meet someone, have, have a success, be hired for something. And, and, uh, and, and even if it's, you know, the, I, I remember so many of these guys would come out of USC film school you know, and they wanted to come to get a meeting somehow uh, on the show, and they come in my office, and they wanted a directing assignment. <laughs> so, well, I saw your film; it's a very good film you did in school. And uh, you know, what what do you uh, want to do? Well, I want to direct. I, I, I thought maybe I could have an assignment. It's like, hey, buddy, <laughs> get in line. You've got, you know, a hundred guys that I know personally and have their home numbers who've been doing this for years, uh, and then you've got several of the writers on the show, several of the producers, several yeah. of the actors, the cinematographer, the editor, they all would like to direct. But yeah. just because you got a degree from some film school, it's, 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 it's amusing the naivete. But then if you would say, well, you know, we might be able to bring you on as a production assistant, you know, in the office, or, you know, and, and you can make script copies and you can do, well, I went to film school, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, well, good luck to you. <laughs> If you, if yeah. you are in the, uh, oh, somebody's being killed there. Oh, uh, uh, it's by dogs. Probably some other dogs are walking past the house. Um, I'm sorry. But the, uh, you know, but it, it is something to be said for putting yourself in the right position, and and those people that think they're beyond that are really deluding themselves because you just have to get there. Steve Cannell was a gopher on a game show, born into a wealthy family, successful people. He didn't need to do that. He probably could have found another way into the industry, but he wanted to learn. He wanted to do. He wanted to meet people, and you know that says it all about him and about you know everybody that works hard. I mean, that you went from news, quit that to you know take a job you didn't feel even qualified for. And I and I watched that show, and you did a great job with that stock footage and second unit blending. But um, uh, you know you. You have to make your own break sometimes and just hope, right. a hope that the door opens. Circling back around, by the way, just for a moment, uh, to we, you, you mentioned about going up to Canada where you were uh, had, had filmed a couple of uh, shows then as well. There was a question uh, that we had from uh, Russell Bruce over here. I want to know about shooting in Canada. Canada. Do you actually move there or is the production company supply housing? Interesting question. Yeah. When... Uh, uh when you're assigned a show or make a contract to produce and direct, write a show, uh, produce, direct a show, 
and you're out of uh, the states, then it's up to the, uh, because of the union contracts, they have to put you up and they have to pay you per diem and all that. And Cannell was always uh, very generous with that. Um, you know, he could have given a lot less in those categories and he didn't. Um, and uh, no, you don't have to move there. Now, understand, this is interesting. Cannell was the first prime time producer of, of television for um, uh, for American television. I mean, uh, uh, Stingray was an NBC network series. It was the first primetime network series being produced in Canada. They had a lot of television shows, they had a lot of movies, but none of them in primetime. They were either in uh, Canadian networks, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Stephen, Stephen put us up and I remember when uh, we moved from uh, Calgary and why we were in Calgary on Stingray, which is supposed to take place uh, in, uh, in Beverly Hills in California. That's why funny. we were in Calgary, which is a country town, an oil and gas town, uh, I'll never know. But uh, Tom may have some enlightenment on that. But anyway, I would fly, I would fly over to Vancouver for casting sessions and then the actors would come into Calgary and we'd do it. And I, I had several conversations with Stephen. I said, this is silly. Uh, let's move to Vancouver. Well, we did move uh, 1986 from Calgary to uh, Vancouver. And uh, he gathered all the unions up and the business people that would be affected by bringing in a company from the States. And we had a big dinner. And he says, uh, I'm going to be the first, but I'm not going to be the last because others will follow. And I'm going to uh, do everything I can, bring my company business up here as well. And he even uh, built a studio. It, it was a, uh, what was it, Tom? A Shinley, a Shinley uh, Brewery Company yeah, yeah. That, had, that had shut down. And Stephen went in and gutted it and built these buildings. And I asked him, uh, you know, in his office there in, in Hollywood, I said, uh, Steve, what happens if you can't keep these stages busy in coming years? And he said, they will be, uh, I'll sell them to beacons and they'll be warehouses. <laughs> uh, but he says, I, I don't think that'll happen. Well, of course they've been extremely successful and, and I think uh, they're still active. It's a big, I think they had like five or seven stages that he built. Yeah, there. yeah. It was big, it was big. Yeah, after he sold the studio to somebody else and they were running it as a studio, that's where yes. we did the Christie. Uh, that's uh, right. And then where we were, in, yeah, so, uh, but uh, anyone anyway, answer that question, the, uh, anytime you're out of town, outside of a radius of a, wherever your home city is, you know, you need a place to sleep. You can't drive home if you're going 200 miles. That wouldn't be safe or practical and, and sensible. So they, they put you up and the, the classier the production, the more money they allocate in their budget for housing. So you go from little cheap motel rooms to suites to full yeah. apartments to houses that they rent, whatever it is. Um, and they usually have everybody in one hotel. A couple of the actors might be in different hotels just to give them some space. And, uh, and then they pay you, you know, that per diem every day to, you know, buy meals and do your laundry and whatever, like in and, and, and a car rental, they give you a car because you have to get around, but it's all part of a location budget. Yeah. I, I loved the years we were up there, Tom, you'll recall we stayed primarily uh, at Sutton Place, right there on Burrard in downtown. I must tell you that when I first went there in 1986, I thought it was the most magnificent city that I'd ever seen. And I'd seen a few, but it was clean. And uh, I, I enjoyed the people there. And I particularly liked uh, the restaurants, as, as you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wonderful place. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned over here then, uh, too, that uh, came from Russell Bruce. And Russell, I think I'd mentioned in previous weeks, actually, he was a prop manager for Siegfried and Roy in Las Vegas. And so, ah. he was, uh, yeah, 
the people coming in from USC, they walked in thinking that <laughs> they knew more than everyone else during the shows and also. Well, I didn't mean to just single them out. I actually yeah. taught at USC at one point, taught screenwriting there in the grad school. Yeah. But the, uh, uh, it's emblematic of, uh, of, of people who are told that they're special. A lot of film schools, they do that. You're the elite few, you're the chosen ones, and you're going to have a big career, and so-and-so, famous director, is an alum. And you can almost brainwash people into thinking that they're entitled to that same success. And, um, and of course, most of them uh, are great people, and, and sure. they, they don't have those lofty expectations, and they will take a subordinate job and work their way up. But there's a few like the one guy that was in my office in particular that I just, you know, I have no idea whatever happened to him, but I'm suspecting, you know, he, you know, was selling insurance or something now because I, you, you can't get it done with that outlook because the rest of us know what it really takes to earn the responsibility of directing a TV episode. Yes, right. And, uh, and sorry, but Chuck worked his way up. How many years were you in the business before you directed your first episode, Chuck? Oh, I think I was uh, about 37, 37, 38 years old before I yeah. directed uh, my yeah. first Incredible Hulk. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I don't know, I, I I was probably 40, you know, when I directed my first one. Yeah. So, you know, you yet I'd been in the business since, you know, I was 20 in college. So you, you, uh, you know, you have to learn all the little puzzle pieces before you can apply them all and combine them. This was a little bit more specific question, but uh, as for hospitalization in Canada, was that yeah. going to be needed in Canada or uh, shipped to the U.S.? Well, it depends on what, what the health issue is. I, I remember that one day I was shooting a, a movie there in downtown Vancouver, and we were going through the line at uh, the lunch break. And as a matter of fact, my wife and son were visiting on the set that day, so she was with me. And uh, she said, uh, you're bleeding. I, uh, what, what, what? I'd just been eating some pudding. And she says, Chuck, you're bleeding from the mouth. And my God, all of a sudden, people were swarming around me, and there was a piece of glass in that pudding. Wow. And so they, they hauled me off uh, to the emergency room and I sat in that emergency room three hours without seeing a doctor. And finally, I got up and left. I had gotten a, some cotton padding and put it in my mouth. And uh, and it stopped the bleeding. And I went back on the set. And uh, You know, Chuck, on, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but when we went up to do the Christie miniseries, yeah. one of the, uh, I think it was the key grip, came up to me and said, listen, if something happens to you and you need hospital, he said, if you go to one of our hospitals, you may not never see anybody. You'll <laughs> die waiting. Said, do what we do. Have somebody throw you in the back of a car, drive across the border to Bellingham, Washington, and uh -huh. go to an American hospital. He said, that's what we all do. Now, remember, this is socialized medicine, and everybody talks about their great medicine. Well, and they do great uh, stuff. Uh, it, I think elective surgeries. You know, you want to have, uh, you know, your ears lifted. You know, okay, well, you know, you can schedule that and they'll do it and they'll pay for it. But if you need something, you need it now, you may not get the care that you need if, if the hospital is overrun and yeah. overworked. So yeah. he just said, get in the back of a car and go to the U.S. And that's what they all do because fortunately Vancouver and Bellingham are pretty short drive. And, um, and I kept that in mind. I never forgot it. It was a little intimidating, actually, but I understood it. And by the time you drove to Washington and got to an emergency room in the U.S., you'd still be waiting <laughs> you know, in, in Vancouver at some hospital to try to see somebody. Well, going from that, by the way, and kind of going back again full circle of some of the many things that you'd worked on and going back to film versus digital, yeah. how has that changed? And is it much easier than now, Chuck, when you're going to be working with digital as a transition from the old to the new as far as having to look at the rushes? And I guess it's a lot easier. Anyhow, is it? I'm sure there's some things easier. What are your what's your thoughts? Well, uh, and, and I have some history about that because uh, I've been a still photographer for a long time, and uh, large format, you know, four by five, eight by ten, etc. And I had my own darkroom set up. And on one of my uh, assignments there in Vancouver, I was with the photographer friend there, 
and he pulled out this little thing about the size of uh, it was a Nikon Cool Picks, and uh, he said, you know, this is going to be the future. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, take a picture here at the table, and I put it on the table and shot a photograph of a glass of red wine. It was gorgeous. Hmm. It was gorgeous. And um, I went back to Los Angeles and was telling some of my photography buddies down here and, and especially the large format people. And they said, listen, it's never going to take the place of, <laughs> you know, our film. Uh, well, I started Were they big selling. investors in Blockbuster also? I beg your pardon? Were they big investors in Blockbuster also? <laughs> yes, also. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I started selling everything I had in uh, film cameras, my dark room, and started investing into uh, digital. And I'm still there. Uh, my oldest son, yeah. uh, my oldest son has uh, dragged his feet yelling and screaming that he was never going to do that. He was never going to go to, to digital um, because it wouldn't take the place. And I've been all through all of those arguments over the years. And my only caution was that this uh, technology is not going to stand still. It's going to keep moving and, and growing and improving. And, you know, you can... Uh, read a lot from people like Roger Deakins, the, the great American cinematographer, who was not going to touch digital and now says that's all he wants to work with. I think he uses the arrows like most uh, big production companies. They list production companies do that. Um, no, the answer to your question, I'm sorry, I've been so windy about this, but the answer is it doesn't change a thing. Hmm. It doesn't change because the performances have to be there. The lens selection has to be there. That's no different, uh, no matter whether you're looking, uh, using an electronic camera or not. Um, and I like the immediacy of it. And again, I think it'll keep improving. I mean, I've, I've shot a couple of little projects uh, with uh, digital 6K and I love them. Uh, I, I really enjoy them. Uh, you know, I told some of my friends in the industry that they've got this thing coming up, uh, LED lights, <laughs> and they would report back that they'll never go there, you know. Yeah. And um, so we, we see, you well, see, you see what's having, happening in the industry. By having that eye of a photographer then, Chuck, uh, does that translate pretty well from when you're behind the uh, the cinematography uh, camera, you know, the still versus the moving camera? It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, a great picture is a great picture, whether it's a still picture or a motion picture picture. Um, and, and I'm fascinated with cinematography and, of course, of still photography and all that. So uh, I, I look for great interest, uh, great interest in the subject. Uh, I look for great... Uh, uh, interested uh, interest in the lighting. It's all about the light. Everything is about the light and how you use it. Um, you know, my favorite magazine every month, well, actually there are two, uh, but the first one is the American Cinematographer. And I've, I've, I've had those, that's a subscription for many, many years. And the other one is Movie Maker Magazine. And and for, for somebody with such a strong visual approach, but you also have acted, yeah. you, know, you know, as well as I do, that there are directors that are like actors, directors, there's guys that, are, right. that are that are really wrapped up in the visual and they don't even talk to the actors. So where do you fall in that spectrum? If, if, if At what point do you really hand off the visual to the DP and then concentrate on the actors. I mean, how do you balance your day being both? Because not everybody is both. Yeah, uh, and I think you I think you already know the answer to that, Tom. Uh, you know, when I hire a DP, we have long conversations about the look that I want, and I expect him to move toward that. Uh, uh, you know, it's been my experience, and again, Tom, uh, you've seen 
see me work, uh, I pick the lens sizes uh, on every shot, or I ask the DP to give me a better suggestion. I have no problem with the DP, you know, overriding me if we have a conversation and he can tell me what the difference is. Uh, but I, th I think maybe some of that is comes from my still background mm -hmm. because nobody picks it, but the guy behind the camera. Uh, but every part of this uh, process, making movies, I love. I, yeah. I have forever. Yeah. Chuck, there's a director you and I both know who go unnamed. But my favorite story about him, uh, what and you can this will reveal to you where he is on that spectrum of visual versus performance. But with, he would do a take, and the take would be over, and then he'd say he'd yell to the DP, "Could you see them?" <laughs> yes, sir. And print it. We're moving print on. It. We're <laughs> moving on. <laughs> so you know, yeah. I, I think you know who it is. But one, yeah. of, my, it's one of my favorite stories because he wasn't kidding because he had to move. Had to move. Were they in the frame? Yeah. Good, we're going. <laughs> we're on the move. We're, we're on, on the move. move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that. I love those kinds of stories. Over the years, you work with so many different uh, celebrities that have gone and big and made it even bigger. And uh, how do you go about having them um, go along with your vision? You, as a director, as a producer, you got this idea, and they may say, "Well, what if I read it this way or whatever?" But you know, they've got to go with what you're saying. And yeah. How how have you how do you work with them to get them to buy into that or for the most part are they they're professionals they say nope, I'm 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 doing this whatever you say boss but uh, or mostly are mostly the real old pros and they're wonderful to work with uh, most of them will say just tell me what you want okay then I'll give it to you and they bam it's done uh, and I like that I like that a lot uh, there are times when you're dealing with somebody with a lot of presence, a lot of experience. And you'll say, my idea is that, uh, you know, coming from the previous moment, you're coming through that door, you go over to uh, the coffee urn, pour yourself a cup of coffee. And the the person you're talking to comes up, et cetera, et cetera. And the conversation begins. And if they say, I got it, then I say, good, let's shoot it. You know, uh, I don't have any trouble. I was, uh, a director on a, a little series. I think that was the She Wolf of London or Werewolf of London, a uh, thirty-minute comedy series. And we had we had a new actress that was uh, coming in to play one of not not the lead guest role, but the second lead guest role, and it was Halle Berry, and uh, stunningly beautiful and a very sweet uh, young woman. Uh, about an hour and a half late to the set and uh, I took her aside and she was very gracious and uh, remorseful that she had caused everybody to wait on the set. Uh, but, but uh, she pulled it off and she was good, you know, would, and again, when you work with the old timers, I mean, Tom and I know of a, a, an old timer that had uh, years and years of experience on Christie. We had her, <laughs> And uh, she was a handful, and I've had a, I've had a couple of the established people that were poo pooing uh, uh, episodic television or movies of the week, and they wouldn't come prepared, and hmm. that was troublesome. And then we'd have conversations, but I mean, I've I've had them in a heap of tears because I made it very clear to them what all of these people are standing around thinking right now while we're waiting on you to, I mean, I've, I've, I've done off camera lines to them and that's embarrassing to them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that leads me to a question about maybe some of the people who you've really worked with. I should say people you've worked with who you really enjoyed. And then the flip side of that, some people who have without mentioning names or some horror stories. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly on, on uh, Dr. Quentin Medicine Woman, it was uh, uh, Jane and Barbara Babcock, Jane Seymour and Barbara Babcock, and, and yeah. certainly uh, Orson Bean, who was our, uh, uh, who was our uh, store owner, uh, our, our general store, one of the most intelligent human beings I've ever met, uh, uh, a man that has 
so much worldly experience. I mean, you know, unless you're my age, you probably don't remember him, but he was the guy. Well, I remember him. In fact, I have him. Uh, I had talked with him on one of my episodes of the podcast. I went to his house and and oh, yeah. had uh, breakfast with him and his wife, Allie. And, yeah. oh, and, and man, yeah, what a guy. I mean, he's brilliant. <laughs> I know what you're saying. You look around his, his walls and you'll see several of my photographs. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we I became very close. Then. <laughs> yeah. They, we became very close friends during uh, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Part of it was uh, we'd both started out on one side of the political yeah. fence and we had crossed over to uh, another uh, in our time. And uh, we could uh, talk about those experiences. Um, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Tom, help me with this. Um, uh, some of the people that I'd worked with, you know, you know I, I've had I've had a few stars of of series that, um, and I two or three run through my mind right now that uh, weren't terribly interested in anybody coming. They were they were kind of directing everything themselves, and uh, you know if, if they came at uh, at me with a heavy hand, I'd just stand off the side and say, "Have at it, buddy." You know, it's, it, it's, it's their, it's their world. And I was, I was a guest and I was okay with that. Uh, but it is obviously some people don't want to be directed. They, yeah, they, they, that's they, right. They, they think they, uh, uh, are, are bulletproof, you know, yep. and, and, uh, a little objective, uh, guidance, uh, you know, the real pros, you know, uh, can't get enough of it, but sometimes they just, you know, pay somebody that kind of money long enough, they, they yeah. kind of lose some of that hunger and that vulnerability. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, when I started, uh, Dr. Quinn medicine woman, the, the first, very first episode, um, Beth Sullivan created that series and she was, she was a wonderful writer creator. And, uh, we were walking from the set out, uh, uh, at the Paramount Ranch off Canaan Road. And I said, Beth, you know, this is your baby. You tell me what the look that you'd like to have of this series. And she says, Chuck, I learned how to write at UCLA. You're the director. You give us the look you want. And I said, okay, thank John Ford. So I, I like to shoot nice and wide, uh, you know, punch in, uh, I, I, I loved all of the, anything that had to do with that Western series. A lot of horseback riding. Uh, it's all kind of frivolous, frankly. I mean, but I just love being there. I just love being well, there. That was a good show, too. Really yeah. good. Before, I, before I would ask any of the actors, including stunt people, uh, if there was a lot of horse work and it was fast-paced, uh, I would do it first. Uh, uh, which wasn't always, I think, the smart way to go. But I had a, I had a couple of interesting incidents on that uh, series. For one thing, we had a trained bear, grizzly bear. Uh, title of the episode was Grizzly. And uh, Jane had come upon this cabin, and this uh, old guy had been mauled to death by this bear. And she had buried him and was kneeling down next to it and over her shoulder our camera is low over jane and this bear rises up behind her and jane turns and faces this damn thing and it's a, it's a real bear we're not talking it's a real grizzly and uh, she turns and runs for the little cabin and uh as we had set it up, the trainer said, "Yeah, you just put a. We'll just put a thin electric wire down that down that path that she's running, and it'll look like that he's chasing her." I said, "Okay, then let's do that." Uh, action, <laughs> and the bear comes up like that. And Jane turns, and she takes off. She makes that run, and I had said just before I called for action. I asked that the both doors of that cabin be opened and we couldn't see from our camera position that second door open, but I wanted it open. And that bear ran 
chasing Jane right through that that cabin before the the trainers got to it. And by the way, I I I, I have no reason to believe that that bear was dangerous, but it was a bear, <laughs> and and uh, Beth Sullivan came down to the set was not pleased with me. Um, and we had several incidents like that. Uh, there was one other I was thinking of. Uh, oh yeah, we had we had an episode called uh, Cattle Drive, and it was big. We it was a one hour episode, and about uh, a day and a half into the shoot, and we had rented 500 head of cattle in Simi Valley uh, that we were going to herd up and down the valley, and. Uh, so I I was shooting and shooting the the pages as uh, required, seven day show, and the word came from the studio the network loves this episode they want it to be a two hour episode, and what do you want to do? <laughs> and so we came up with the idea of the second act, uh, or the the end the fifth act was going to be a prairie fire. And of course, we had we had plenty of stock footage to help us establish that, but we put big smokers across, and we drove that uh, herd of cattle down through a pre-described area. And I was on uh, a horse that I always rode there, and I had a what we called a pogo stick, which was a little more than a broom handle, but a 16 millimeter camera attached to the bottom of it. And I just rode right along with them and got some terrific shots, moving shots. And we rode through right through the smoke and all that. We we had a, a runaway herd of, of cattle that day. And I made an, the second run. I was inside the uh, wagon, uh, covered wagon with stunt people driving. And I shot it from that position. But those were things that I really enjoyed. I had, I had a good time doing things. In a situation like that, was that something that they came to you and said, Hey, we like this and we're going to make this go from one hour to two hours. Yes. Did they uh, go to the script writers and they're going, Oh my gosh, I don't like on this. And so they had to be tearing out their hair. I think every day they would send me out pages. And I remember one day I got the new pages to shoot that day or the next day. And I said, but we've already shot that scene. The, one of the other writers thought that was a great thing to write, and we had shot it uh, by another writer uh, had uh, sent it out a few days before. Yeah, keep in mind, Scott, that a typical one-hour episode takes several weeks to conceive, uh, you know, to write the script, to rewrite the script, to polish it, to vet it, and all of that. They pushed the button on this on like day three of the previous episode, so they had about three or four days to conceive it, fledge yeah. it out, figure out how it's all going to go. Our scene's going to be inter, you know, stuck in the one that he already is shooting, or is this going to be an addendum exclusively? That's nuts. That, that's like all hands on deck for the writers yeah. and trying to collaborate with him and what it's yeah. going to be and, and probably Jane Seymour. So uh, it's very cool, I think. Oh, well, have you had a situation like that, Tom, where it's happened to you in which they have come to you and said, uh, hey, we want to stretch this from an hour to two hours <coughs> as a screenwriter? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, it, you Sometimes you have an episode and it's just running long. It's a good episode and you have the right number of pages. But the way it's unfolding, you would call the network and say, look, we're going to wind up with a 90 minute episode here pretty quickly. Why don't we do a two parter or a two hour? And. and and, and if they say yes, then you have to just figure out what added scenes are going to, you know, are going to go where. And, and uh, but you've already spent the money in one form or another, and it's it's economically viable to do it that way if you have the right material, and then you have you know the right director. When uh, Chuck came down to Orlando and did a bunch of Swamp Thing episodes for us. That was that was the test of his metal, and uh, but you know we were uh, we were up against as you've heard in previous weeks, but we were up against um, a, a shrunken budget, sixty percent less than the previous showrunner had to spend, and we had uh, uh, issues with the show that had to be resolved creatively. 
and money and money was really tight. So everything had to be done a certain way within a certain set of parameters. And the directors that could do that, Chuck was preeminent of those, uh, were goals because we could get this stuff done and still have a good time uh, together. And we did. I mean, it was a wonderful show. Yeah. A real career highlight for me being on that show with those wonderful people in Orlando and and uh, knew, you know, and a couple of the writers. I mean, that was really, really great. Yeah. What was your experience with that, Chuck? Did you enjoy it? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. You know, it, it's interesting, and Tom, Tom can uh, elaborate on this, but my personal feeling always was the less I have, the more creative I had to be. Uh, there were many times it happens in television and movies all the time. You prep something, everybody agrees to it. You go out on the set and then equipment is not there that uh, everybody had signed off on. And it may be, you know, the most important scenes and especially big scenes that um, you're, you're having to face in that uh, particular episode of Movie of the Week. And I had that happen, and rather than getting very upset about it, I would just walk off to the side and I'd think, how can I do something that's not planned but make it look better than what I had planned? And that was always the test for me, is how can I, you know, just come out and create something? Well, and you, know, you can't see it. What, um I may have said this in the previous week uh, when Steve Sears was on, but the, the the takeaway for me on that show in particular, Swamp Thing, is that creativity costs nothing. Yeah, it's absolutely free. You could be if you you don't you can have twelve cents to spend, but boy, if you're creative, that twelve cents can look like twelve dollars, yeah. you know, real real easily. And and that show was a perfect example with our uh, Orvis Rigby, our great production designer and uh, few of the people on the crew who were uh, Tom Allen, the sound mixer. I mean, all these wonderful people um, were so creative and so involved uh, at a level that I had not seen on very many shows. And it allowed us to do this preposterously ambitious scripts with no resources, really, other than the back lot of Universal Studios. Boy, that was fun trying to figure that stuff out. Uh, let me tell you, here's what Tom did to me on that. This was <laughs> this this is what Tom did to me. Oh, I know. He this says, one. yeah, yeah. Uh, he says, I've got a Western for you, Chuck. And I said, God, that's great, Tom. Let's let's do that. So I went down there and uh, we got our team together to go look at the Western streets and the uh, sets, the saloon, et cetera. I'd not seen them before. And uh, we had stuff to, to shoot out on the, the, the street in front of the sets, et cetera. And I went down there and it was all flats, just flats. There was no return. If I started to shoot this way, this way, I would shoot right into a crowd. Uh, over this way is the tour bus. So <laughs> it's how am I going to shoot here. that? You know, it was the Western stunt show. Yes, that's right. It was the Western and, stunt and, show, and it was about fifty or hundred feet long, and that was all there yeah, was. To that it. was all there was to it. And I remember <laughs> calling Tom, and I said, "You know, what the hell do you want me to do here?" He said, "Figure it out." <laughs> and we had a ball. We just well, had. I, I knew that you would, you know, cheat your angles, and, uh, and that Orbis would build you a great interior somehow because he was yeah. great, and. And you would cheat the reverse angles. That That's right. Were possible. You would cheat them shooting against the same walls you used for something else. And it worked great. And nobody would ever know that that was not done at Backlot Universal or something on the real Western Street uh, in, in Hollywood, uh, you know, Warner Brothers or something. It was a wonderful looking show, but oh, it, we had it, it was at night. Remember? Yes, it was. Everything yeah. was made at night. So. <coughs> If it didn't have a light on it, it was pitch black, and you didn't know that there was literally nothing there. Yeah. So a couple of street lamps. <coughs> Sorry. And <coughs> and um, night hides a lot of sins. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, yes. oh, 
that yeah. was speaking of which there was a question I wanted to bring in that Russell Bruce had asked again, kind of along that uh, line over there on large sets. Uh, would you talk about the production costs from doing location shootings? Like instead of going to wherever, I mean, that was kind of interesting that they were, you were shooting in Canada for something that was supposed to look like it was in Hollywood. I mean, when you were already there, I mean, but uh, anyhow, can you address, one of you address that question? Well, I think uh, Tom can address it better than I can, I think, but, but um, with the breaks that you got for your taxes from the province and from the country, the feds in Canada, it was cheaper to shoot there. I mean, it was simple economics. Uh, it was cheaper to shoot up there Makes than sense. it was to shoot in L.A. Uh, and I can't remember exactly who was governor then, but they weren't going to give an inch to help the film industry. And the film industry went to the state several times and asked for some breaks so that we could keep production uh, here. And they turned a deaf ear. Um, and I shot, uh, subsequent years, I shot uh, all over the United States and all in states where they would, they would work with the film companies. And of course, they're in Georgia now and Texas with Walker, Texas, Ranger. Right. And, um, you know. Uh, A lot of stuff shot in Austin. Oh, yes. Yeah, we shot in Dallas, or outside Dallas, didn't we, Tom? Oh, yeah. Yeah. All, yeah. Over, yeah. all, over, all over the Metroplex, everywhere. Yeah. We were everywhere. We shot at Galveston. And, and uh, in Galveston, we did a show, a couple of shows down there. Well, you know, the couple episodes. The the thing about doing a, a, a sci-fi show, and you have these huge sets, is that you can spend the money and make, build them, and then you amortize the cost of those across sure. all the episodes you're making. So... Um, you, so you build your big home set, and then a lot of those pieces can be reused to be other rooms and other parts of the ship or wherever they have their they have their stuff that work when they're going to they're going to go to a planet. Or you got you go out on location, or it's going to be structure of some kind, and they'll often just recycle flats and sets and paint them different. And and uh, right. even on a big, big, big budget show, uh, you know, Game of Thrones or something, uh, you know. You got castles and things they, they have as uh, to use all they want, but there are sets that they have that they own, and they just keep reusing them and turn them around and change it. And that's where production designers can can be yes. unbelievably uh, helpful. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, I uh, start to wrap up over here. I want to thank you very much, Chuck. I should, we've got a lot of a lot more stories, a lifetime of stories that we can go down so many different paths there. And I appreciate you being our guest today and uh, sharing some of these things with us. It's been just phenomenal. Thank you. Well, it's delightful to meet you, Scott. And Tom is such an old and dear friend that uh, anytime he appears, I want to be included. Huh? <coughs> no. He says no. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. Chuck, if you want to hang on for just a, a little bit, we're, after we uh, sure. leave the studio over here, that uh, we'll bring you back on. Just the three of us okay. can chat here for a little sure. bit, so I'll bring you, you back bet. on. But again, thanks again very much. Thank you. And uh, yeah, had a few people over here who were just saying, uh, yeah, these are, are, are interesting. Um, sorry, they're only an hour long. Yeah, <laughs> it could go uh, longer, certainly, and go down so many different trails. But then, you know, even uh, Bruce would get bored. So you you Neat and tidy. Yes, we do. So I uh, thank all the people who were on here, Tom, uh, you and Russell and others who had made comments. I appreciate you guys uh, 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 joining in and, and the chat line then as well. And I uh, just want to remind everybody then as well, if they'll go over then to uh, TomBlumquist.com, you can check out his books that are available uh, right. and the most recent one of Devious Thinking, which is uh, a, a good read. I think you guys would uh, certainly enjoy. And um, that, uh, yeah, you're welcome, Gump. Mike Leary was uh, one of our uh, guests uh, here recently, so uh, great to, to have hey, you. Mike. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Harriet. Glad that you enjoyed it then as well. Well, listen, uh, we're going to be having another great uh, guest coming up then again next week. And so if you make sure that you just subscribe to the Facebook channel over here, I should say like the channel, which is Mincing Movie Magic. There is where we have the opportunity to deconstruct and just tear apart and mince <laughs>
behind the scenes of what's going on that makes uh, the magic in all the movies and television. So uh, it, uh, Tom continues to, to bring in uh, a lot of uh, big heavy hitters like we did here today with Chuck Bowman of having uh, him as our guest. And week after week, it just is uh, constantly tremendous guests. And so uh, come back again next week and enjoy somebody else. So. Right. Uh, and Tom, I wish I could say I enjoyed uh, chatting with you also. Um, <laughs> but I know better. <laughs> but I know better. <laughs> but I, I enjoy uh, talking to your friends, and you're just kind of okay, you know, yeah. in there too. So I'm just the eye candy. I'm just the eye candy. The eye candy. <laughs> That's right. Thanks again. Buddy, I appreciate it. And, uh, and thanks for uh, letting me be a, a guest and uh, hang out over at your place with uh, you and Ann and Katie and Charleston. Uh, I love it. And, and um, yep, yeah, it's uh, going to be a busy week. I've got a uh, thing I'm doing then uh, tomorrow. I've got a, a magic show that I'm going to be doing a, on a boat uh, down in the bay down near Galveston. He mentioned Galveston. I'm going to be down there. And then my other show that I do on Thursday night, which is uh, mainly for magicians, but um, that is a virtual happy hour. Gets a gets a chance to uh, to get together. But anyhow, thank you guys again, and uh, join us again next week. Please subscribe to uh, my channel, and uh, if you would, I mean, uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Texas Magician. Uh, I'm not asking much, you know. Just <laughs> could just use you to go over to the uh, channel when you can, the Texas Magician, and uh, and subscribe. Uh, and also be sure to like the Mincing Movie Magic page, so that way you keep up to date. You know, whenever we're going to be going live then uh, next week and whenever it's going to be. Anything uh, you want to say then, Tom, before we head out? What a darn thing! Okay. Said it all. I've said it all. Until next week. That was Tom Blumquist. This is Scotty out. Thanks for being with us. Please join us again next time for Mincing Movie Magic.